We can park right here in this moment for the rest of tonight. But God wants to do something. I believe that there is impartation. It's going to happen at some point in this service, at the end of this altar call. I believe that you're going to walk away with a fresh revelation of who God's called you to be in your purpose. You're going to walk away with a fresh anointing. And it's not just going to be just a handful of us that are reaching, but this whole room is about to be saturated in the next few moments with the power of the Holy Ghost. Do you believe that with me here tonight? Do you believe that Jesus is getting ready to be poured out? And you're going to walk out of this room. You're going to walk out of rain night. You're going to walk out of this hyphen conference with a fresh touch of God, with a fresh revelation of your purpose, with a fresh power of the Holy Ghost burning inside of your life. Do you believe that with me? Hallelujah. Satana Bahasataya. But if you believe that with me tonight, if you believe this with me, and I believe that you do, God only works through one way. God is only going to flow, and he, you're only, I mean, we can have a great worship experience, but I'm talking like the kind of altar where you go away and you write this down in your calendar or write it in your journal or put a note on your phone or you text your mom and be like, tonight, something has changed in me. That's going to happen. In the name of the Lord Jesus, it's going to happen. Some of you are going to be healed in your mind, in your spirit. But there's a way that we're going to have to take first that's going to move this incredible experience with the Lord from a great time of worship to a time of transformation. So I want us, if we could, turn in our Bibles to Genesis 35. I, I want to give honor to Brother and Sister Reaver. They've been, I've known them. Um, I always have a speech prepared when I get to the U.S. border because depending on the mood of the guard, um, though they got this new thing where they just scan my face and I walk through, I don't know if I should think that's really relaxing or kind of weird that they knew who I was when I walked in. They took a picture of me and some waved like, oh, Mr. Shaw, welcome to the United States. I, I don't know if that was cool or not, but you have, I had a speech and like, what are you going to do in the country? I was like, I'm going to visit family, friends. And it would be true because you have known, Brother Reaver, you've been to Ontario, I think all the way back. I think I was maybe 10, 11, 12 years old. Um, and uh, so you've, you've been... Um, you've been a kind of a part and connected to our family for uh, a long time. And so I want to give honor to you. Thank you for your hospitality. Thank you for introducing me to Baltimore Crab Cakes. Um, that was awesome. I mean, the only other time I've had a crab cake was in an airport. And I want to let you know that what you get here in Baltimore, way different than what you get at an airport. Because um, that was, well, I mean, most food is, is different than what you get in an airport. And, uh, oh, there we go. And we've had, I've had such a great time. And Brooke, you've done an awesome job putting together. Isn't this a great service? It's worship team. And uh, I'm really awkward with the introductory stuff. I'm really only good at one thing, and that's like preaching. So um, if I have forgotten anybody or forgotten anything, I'm sorry. I'm not, not neglecting anyone. It's just, I'm, this, that's not part of this service I'm good at, okay? So Genesis chapter 35, we're going to read a bunch of verses of Scripture, but hey, it's the Bible, and it's good for us to read. And so, then God said to Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and to all who are with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves. Change your garments. Then let us arise and go to Bethel. And I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all of the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree which was by Shechem. Let's jump down to verse 9. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. 
Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Also God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you and to your descendants after you I give this land. Then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel. That's the whole story. But if I were to put a title on the message I'm going to preach to us today, it'd be this, after the terebinth tree. After that first part of the story where it says, put away the foreign gods, purify yourselves, change your garments. And so they put all that stuff in Jacob's hands and it says, and Jacob hid them, I believe it's verse four, under the terebinth tree. And then verse 9 says, Then God appeared to Jacob. I want to talk to you today, but after the terebinth tree. Lord, I pray you'd be with us. Touch us today by the power of your Spirit. I pray, Lord, that your hand would be on us in everything that we do tonight. I pray, God, that you would have your way. Jesus, we're living in such a weird time. That God, you're really not interested every time that we gather together, especially God as young adults, Lord, to have church as usual, church as normal. You're wanting transformation. God, we want to be changed. I don't just want to do Pentecostal stuff and go away and say we sang loud and we clapped hard and that was great. But Lord, I want you to change us. I want you to change us. And Lord, there is a process that transformation, revelation, impartation, and healing happens. I pray we would go by that way tonight. In the name of Jesus, and everybody say amen. amen. You may be seated. Jacob's life is an absolute mess. And if you're not familiar with the story at this particular juncture in Jacob's life, I want to give you like a quick synopsis of what's been going on in Jacob's world because it sounds like something, and I know I'm dating myself as an old millennial, it sounds like something at a Mori that I would watch when my mom would take us to the laundromat because our washing machine was broken for a number of years of my life. And we would go there, Mori would be on. Jacob's life sounds like it comes from an episode. Some of you are going to have to Google that when you get home. You probably, it's probably not the greatest show for you to be watching. It's kind of like Jerry Springer. Again, only makes sense if you're a Gen Xer, younger Gen Zers in the room. It's like the weird cringy videos you see on TikTok or Instagram. That's pretty much what Maury is. But Jacob's life was a mess. He's married to a woman who he doesn't love. And also to one he does. The Lockwood. And to make matters worse, they're sisters. He's married to a woman who he doesn't love and then to one he does. And they're both sisters. So there's drama there. He's been in conflict with the father of his wives, the father-in-law, Laban, who's tricked him multiple times, first by getting him really drunk at his wedding, so drunk that he did not recognize that he married the wrong girl until the next day. And then he's messed up his father-in-law again on the exit they had a big fight and as he's leaving he's had a run in with his older brother Esau which is referenced in the text now Esau and Jacob have hated one another for a very long time because there's this little thing where Jacob completely robbed his big brother Esau out of the blessing which was when Jacob would or Jacob would receive the blessing is when the father would lay his hands upon his firstborn son and he would impart to him all the blessings of God that were on his life. Well, Jacob stole Esau's blessing. Esau was supposed to get the blessing. Jacob was supposed to get whatever wasn't sold in the garage sale after his father's death because he was the younger brother. But that didn't happen. Jacob stole the blessing, but he also took away his inheritance through deception. Now, it eventually ended up being okay. They hugged it out, which was fantastic. But Jacob had so predicted the massacre of his family and livestock 
that before his running with Esau, he divides up everybody and he's like, we can't kill all of them if we put them into two groups. So let's divide them into two and we'll figure out who he's going to kill. He settles in Shechem only to have another tragedy hit his family. His daughter, Dina, is sexually assaulted by the prince of the country. And in retaliation, hit two of his sons, Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, after saying, we can fix this sexual assault by having you marry our sister. But the problem is, in order for you to marry our sister, all the men in the city have to get circumcised. And so that's what happens. But then as the men are feeling a little under the weather, they murder every man in the city. They plunder their wealth, steal their livestock, and kidnap all the women and children of Shechem. So after all of this, God says to Jacob, you want to know what? Probably be a good idea if you left town. <laughs> Don't, when everybody else kind of like gets better and, and like the other neighbors from the other towns, like they're going to wipe you off the face of the earth. It would be a good idea if you guys moved. And I need you, and this is where we end up with the text. I want you to go back to the first place where you and I really met and talked. Remember when you had deceived your brother and your father um, and then had to run away because your brother was going to kill you and then uh, you had a, a vision of I was still going to fix and help your life despite the fact that you had messed all of it up? Yeah, that. Since we're back here again and you've messed up your life, I want you to go back to the place where you first met me when you last messed up your life and there we're going to talk. Because Jacob, it's time for you to get your life back on track. You need to go back to the place where you really saw me for the first time time and our text records Jacob's response to the call of returning to his meeting place with God Genesis 35 verses 2 and 3 and Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him put away the foreign gods that are among you purify yourselves change your garments then let us arise and go up to Bethel. Jacob says, okay, God, we're going to meet with you. God, I'm going to return to the place that you first affirmed your hand and your plan on my life. But if I could call the family together, he says, before we go meet with God, after all the things that have happened, after the tragedy that happened with Dina, after the revenge of her brothers, after my messed up two marriages, after the deception I dealt with Laban, after my problems with my brother Esau, we're going to go fix things with God. But before we get to the place where we can have a real conversation with God, we got to get rid of a few things. See, Jacob was a monotheist. That means he believed only in one God. But over along the way, he had picked up some idols and some false gods. And the journey of his life and his family's journey with him, they picked up some strange gods, foreign gods. That meant they didn't belong. They were not part of God's plan. They were These gods were not supposed to be insiders in their life. And before he made his journey back to Bethel, moving to Bethel necessitated spiritual preparation. It wasn't just a matter of packing up the goats and the camels and heading to the new place because the old neighborhood was bad. There had to be a conversation with God first and meeting with God first men getting rid of all of his idols and I'm going to preach to some people here today that meeting with God first means that you still got to get rid of all of your idols this is not my words but this is the words of the apostle John when he said in 1 John 5 21 little children keep yourselves from the idols Amen. The call to people desiring to meet with God comes with the same prerequisites today. Like Jacob, you need to meet with God so you can change and fix some stuff in your life. It's cool, you will. But you got to get rid of your idols first. Now for some of us in this room, I don't know what it's like for all of you, but I live in an extremely post-Christian country 
In fact, most of the people that are getting saved right now are coming into paganism. And so I'll just be really plain that when I'm talking about getting rid of idols, for some people in this room, it may be actual idols. It may be things like along the way in your Christian spirituality, you've picked up new age or you've started to mess around with ancestral spirits or paganism or witchcraft or fortune telling or you got good luck charms in case Jesus doesn't work out. You got superstitions that are in your life that govern your decisions. The apostle Paul says, what am I trying to say? Am I saying that food offered to idols has some significance or the idols are real gods? No, not at all. I'm I'm saying these sacrifices are offered to demons not to God and I don't want you to participate with demons Paul says that these idols are nothing they're not real gods the superstitions are fake but the spiritual world behind the behavior is very real and if you want to get with God and get right with God you've got to get rid of your idols even if it means you're gonna walk away from your family even if it means you're gonna walk away from your culture even if it means you're going to change things in your life, let him who names the name of Christ depart from idolatry and depart from iniquity. But let's think about what an idol is for a second because I had a great crowd response on that last portion and praise God for that. But there's a chance that you may have ditched the rabbit's foot, but you still got some idols all up in your life. Because what's an idol? The basics of an idol are man-made things that you worship. An idol is anything that replaces your worship of God. It's a man-made thing that captures your attention, that you serve and you give respect and honor to. Well, why would we do something like that? It seems so silly. For a human being to seek a man-made object for transcendence. Because that's why we worship, right? That's why we worshiped here tonight. We were in search of something transcendental. And trans transcendence is simply to be in the presence of something so great, so vast. Our minds, our little human brains are overwhelmed by the vastness of what we are experiencing in the moment. Our humanity is dwarfed by the divine. And our worldview is challenged and our heart is transformed. And we leave the place changed with a fresh outlook. And so how in the world can a human-made object offer something? Thing that transcends human comprehension because it took a human to make it how can something that is made by a person then dwarf their creator by its greatness can't it makes no sense it's a dumb thing to do it's crazy so why do people make man-made things in their life and then serve them as if they are a god why do some people that maybe even go to church and do like worship stuff go and spend their Monday to Saturday life as worshipers of man-made things? Control. See, idols, because you make them with your own hands, they can be controlled, they can be manipulated, and they can be cajoled to a life of your own making. See, when you are transcended by something greater than you, when you are dwarfed in the presence of something more powerful than you, you don't control it or it, it controls you. It resets you. You don't get to make it do what you want. It has the power to make you do what it wants and so from this fundamental and basic definition idols don't have to be throwing dust worshiping ancestral spirits going to a fortune teller or reading your horoscope it could be your job your job can be an idol. Advancing your career, being obsessed with money, being obsessed with the things in the life that money can provide for you, where you will sacrifice on the altar of money and career your convictions, your values, your spiritual health, your mental health, your ministry, your purpose, your calling. You will put yourself in compromising situations that you never would have did at 16 because you got to pay the rent now idols can be things like possessions working ourselves to death 
so we can acquire clout from people that follow us on social media. Idols can be people. It can be our relationship networks. It's, we are so desperate to be affirmed by our peers that when our friendship circle begins to lead us away from God, we offer up redemption and the propitiation of Christ on the altar of being able to fit in with others. Because being a young adult can be lonely. Or maybe it's experiences. Or entertainment. Even family and our closest relationships. They all can be idols where we use things and we use people and we use resources to try to fill some deep hole in our hearts that's searching for something to transcend our spirits. Using things and people that we can manage and that we can use to create the life that we want for ourselves, that we can manipulate and we can control. But Jacob said, before we go meet with God, we got to get rid of all these idols. We got to get rid of the strange gods. We got to get rid of the stuff that doesn't. That's why they were called foreign. It wasn't that they came from another country, it's that they were strange for the purpose that God had for them. They were strange in the covenant that God had called them to keep. In other words, they did not belong. They were not meant to be there. They had no citizenship rights to the relationship. And so Jacob said, if you want to meet with God, we got to get rid of the stuff that should not belong in our life. We got to get rid of the things that should not be there. And then he says, verse 4, Change your garments. Coupled with this call to turn in their false gods, everyone changed their clothes. Purifying themselves from anything that may have touched the idol. It would have seemed extreme to so many people around them. They would have got, okay, you're a monotheist, get rid of the idols. But why are you burning anything that's been associated with the idols? That's extreme. That's legalistic. Why you got to be so intense like that? But Jacob would have told you that consecrating themselves to God was all-encompassing. Nothing in their family would be left untouched in this fresh surrender to God. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. In this passage, the Apostle Paul is reaching all the way back to the old Levitical ceremonial and sacrificial system. And when they would make a sacrifice and they would make an offering to God in the days of Leviticus, they didn't just offer to God the prime cuts of the animal, but when they brought a lamb or they brought a goat or a bull or when they brought a bird to God, they laid all of it on the altar. And what Paul is saying in this passage is if you're going to follow God, every bit of you has to be surrendered to him. There is no spiritual life and then there is secular life. There is no sacred and secular divide. All of my life is worship to God. All of my life is surrender to God. My culture doesn't get this part and Jesus gets another. No, my body, my mind, my soul, everything that touches my life is surrender to Jesus. Everything. Everything that touched the idol had to go. And they collect all the foreign gods. It says, so they gave Jacob all the foreign gods, verse 4, which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree, which was at Shechem. He took all the idols, he collected them all from all his kids, all his family members all of his employees and he found a terebinth tree and there he didn't just bury them as the text says he hid them what does hiding imply 
Hiding implied that when they got done with Bethel, there was no way for them to return and dig up what they left behind. There was no option for them to go back. They had to get rid of it all. This wasn't a promise at an altar call where, God, if you do this, then I will give up that. God, if you will fix this, then I'm going to surrender that. God, I promise if you'll take care of this, God, I'm going to take care of that. And then when God comes through, you find yourself kind of slipping back into the person that you used to be. No, he really buried those idols and you need to really bury yours too. Can I tell you how it is sometimes? Some people, God saves them from a mighty long way. He pulls them out of sin. But people, they love, they're in church and they love to talk about Jesus, but they live vicariously through their past lives by under the guise of their testimony. Some people keep bringing up the past. They keep sharing all those nasty pictures on Instagram and they, can't, they say, look what the Lord has done and I'm thankful for your testimony, but you need to check yourself. Are you putting that stuff stuff out there so people can glorify God or you're trying to relive some old memories of the past. You gotta bury your old life. You gotta bury who you used to be. If you catch yourself reliving that old sinful past, you need to bury it again at an altar. There's gotta be no reminder. There's gotta be no option to return. There have not a thing in your life is left untouched from Jesus Christ. This is the part of the message. Whoa. Whoop. There we go. This is the part of the message where I mess a little bit with your life. And I'm not saying this is for everybody. But some of us, we still got clothes hanging in our closet that remind us of who we used to be before Jesus found us. Trying to donate them or throw them out. Because every time you go through the closet, you're like, hmm, remember when I used to do that? That was fun. Get rid of it. No, you bury the idol and you don't go back to that club. You don't go back to that bar. You don't go back to those old friends. But you keep the memories alive. Bury that junk. Some of you have subscription services that need to be canceled. You said, I'll set up a pin so I don't watch the bad content. But you're the one that set up the pin and you still watch the bad content. So maybe what you need to do is get rid of the subscription altogether. Save your money and you don't need HBO Max to begin with. Some of you have credit cards because your idol is not sexual immorality or worldliness. But some of you have got an addiction to money and possessions and things. So your idol is facilitated through your credit card. You need to cut it up and you need to get rid of it in your life. Some of you still got numbers on your phone of people that you used to sin with just in case maybe they come to church. Flirt and convert is a myth so you shouldn't try it. Don't you try to be the first one that saves somebody out of the world. He is bad for you. She is toxic to you. Get their numbers out of the phone. Some of you need to unfollow people on social media or you need to do what I tell new Christians and young adults when they come to church. Don't use, don't stay connected to those people that you stay. If you still want to be on Instagram, you make a new account and you follow people that are headed in the same direction as you are. Oh, but pastor, I'm going to win them. Oh, but pastor, I'm going to change them. No, they're pulling you in the wrong direction. It's time for you to bury the idol of that old relationship. But pastor, I'll be lonely. Who cares? I would rather be lonely and get to see Jesus. I would rather be lonely and get to Bethel. I would rather be lonely and get to the place that God has for me than hang on to my idols. I don't really follow anybody here, so I'm not calling anybody out, but if the shoe fits, wear it. Some of you need to clean up your social media. Delete those old pics. Get rid of those old reels. Bury the idols. Start making the changes. Now, if money is your idol, wealth is your idol, pay your tithes at the dismissal of the service. 
If career is your idol and you're picking up so many extra shifts that you are missing out on what God has for you and you never make it to church and you never participate in godly community, it's time for you to start making church a priority. If things are your idol, then you need to stop buying stuff even when you can't afford it. You need to practice the discipline of stewarding your resources well. Why? Because you've buried your idols. You've only got one God who belongs to you. You've only got one God who's in covenant with you. You only got one God whom you worship and his name is Jesus. In fact, if I can say this here tonight, if you have never been baptized in Jesus' name, what ultimately needs to be buried is not your phone, your friend list, or your old text messages. What ultimately needs to be buried is you. You've got to be buried. Arise and wash away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. Romans 6, 4 says, Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Hear me, if you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you need to speak to pastor at the end of this service or if you're not from this church, speak to your pastor and say, I've got to bury the old me. I've got to bury the old life. It's got to go down and be buried underneath a place where I can't bring up those old sins. I can't dig that old life up. You've got to be baptized in Jesus' name. Let's go back to Jacob. Let's go back to Jacob. Genesis 35, verse 9. Then God appeared to Jacob again. When he came from Padan Aram and blessed him, and God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply a nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you. And kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you and to your descendants after you I give this land. Then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. After all the idols are buried. After all the idols are buried and everything that touched them was burned. God meets with Jacob and reaffirms Jacob's identity and his purpose. He reveals himself through his name to Jacob. And then reveals Jacob's new identity to Jacob who's standing there in the presence of God. The two greatest human needs in any person's life, including everyone that's in this room, is to know God and to know why you exist. There is a hunger within the human soul to experience the presence of God. And we try to fill that hole inside of our soul with idols. But the idols cannot fill something that only God can. We long for God. Every person in this room, every human being that is right now walking the streets of this great city is longing. They may not even know it. They may not be aware of it. They long to know and be known by God. And with that, there is a hunger to know why God put us here. Does life have meaning? Do I have meaning? Does life have a purpose? Or do I just surf about the globe until death comes? Do I have a purpose and a meaning for my existence? And it is after the terebinth tree that Jacob gets both. It is after the terebinth tree when the idols are buried, that Jacob gets to say, I've seen God. He's visited me. He's told me he's the Almighty One. This is more than an intellectual affirmation of God's omnipotence. It is a fresh revelation of God's person. 
And Jacob walked away and he said, I've seen God. I've heard his voice. I've felt his presence. And now that I've seen God, I'm changed. My whole identity has changed. This is who I am supposed to be, Jacob would tell you. I'm not just here to raise these flocks of sheep and amass a kingdom for myself. I am here because God has called me. I am connected to a purpose that started with Abraham and now continues with me. I'm connected to a purpose that's going to transform the world because from my my family will come a nation and from my nation will come kings and from those kings will come a savior that will bless the whole world. This is why I am here, Jacob would tell you. I've come to preach to a young adult. When you see God as the almighty one for yourself, it will change everything in your life. You want hope? Get a revelation of Jesus. If you want peace, you get a revelation of Jesus. All of that emotional wandering and wondering that you feel with things and sex and social media, it can be taken care of if you would just see Jesus. Do you live plagued by fear? You need to see Jesus. Do you want to be assured of your salvation? You need to see Jesus. Because when you see Jesus, Jesus, Jesus changes everything. And you'll walk away and say, I'm not just here to build a half decent life, to make some friends, own a few nice things. I am on this planet because God of heaven has called me. God has purpose for my life. I am part of the church of the living God. I am a member of the body of Christ and I am here to serve the mission of the kingdom. My stuff's not mine. My money isn't mine. My life isn't mine. My family isn't mine. When I have kids, they aren't mine. But when we are here, it is for a greater purpose that transcends my human life. I am here for the kingdom of God. I am here to advance the church. I am here because I got anointing and purpose. Some of you may be missionaries. Some of you may get married and have children. And God may call them to be missionaries. To every parent in the room. To every couple about to be married and maybe one day build a family. How different would you live your life if you knew that God wanted to use your kids to change the world? What idols would you bury? I'm here to tell you, God wants to call your kids to change the world. Every young adult that's here, if it is God's plan for you to have a relationship and be married, I want to let you know that it is the purpose of your relationship to fulfill the kingdom of God and to change the world. For those of you that are here and you are single, it is the purpose of God for you to change the world. How different would you live your life if instead of pining away for a date, you would say, I am here on this planet because God has called me. How different. How different. I'm I'm coming to a close. I'm coming to a close in a few moments. Piano player, if you could come. How different. Would you treat the resources of your time and your money if you knew that in your hands were things that God has given you to change the world? What idols would you bury? What screen time would you crucify? If you knew that God wanted to use your day to change the world. How different would you treat your paycheck in your entry level career. If you knew the resources that God has poured into your life were not for personal enrichment but for kingdom advancement. God wants to use the resources of your time and your mind and your money to build his kingdom. It's not a what if. 
It is a for certain, this is the purpose of God for you. I don't need to prophesy. I don't need to see a vision. I don't need to have an angel speak to me. I can let you know from a certainty, it is the plan of God for every last dollar, every bit of your time, the resources of your intellect and mind to be consecrated to God as an offering. To say, Lord, use me however you wish. How different would you view yourself as you get on the bus, get on the train, get in the car, fight traffic and go to work, walk into the grocery store. If you knew that God has anointed you to make a difference. God has anointed you to make a difference. It's not what if, it is a certitude if you would just walk in it. You want to know what changed my life and my wife's life and has caused us to reach and begin to win people all in our neighborhood. And my wife, who's a, she is a very introverted person, but she is right now working with about 10 people trying to win them. We're having conversations and we're saying, do you understand that the people we work with and the people on their street, we're their pastor. They just haven't figured it out yet. We're, we're here to preach the gospel to them. They just haven't figured it out yet. What if you, when you would go to work or you would go to the grocery store, if instead of getting frustrated with the rude waitress, you would say, I'm about to teach her a Bible study. She just hasn't found out yet. I want to let you know it is the purpose and plan of God for every last bit of your life to be consecrated to him. Two great needs. Know God. Find purpose. Jacob found both at Bethel after he hid his idols under the terebinth tree. Here's the big point. If you make any notes from this sermon, you need to write this down. Consecration always precedes revelation. If you want to see God revealed... If you want to see yourself revealed, if you, if you are here and you're looking for your mind to be healed, you're looking for your life to be healed, you're looking to find the purpose for existence, you're looking to find the purpose and the calling that God has for your life, there's a hunger within inside of you to do more than just get an education, get a job, and go to work. But inside you, there is a desire to do something that really matters. I want to let you know you will never find God or find your purpose. I until you visit a terrible tree and you bury your life under the altar of Jesus Christ and you walk away from everything that's got an idol stamped on it because on the other side of your terrible tree is everything you've been looking for who God is and who he's called you to be on the other side of your surrender is a fresh experience with the Lord. So many young adults want revelation and purpose. They want hope and presence and mission. You cannot really get those unless you bury your idols. If you, in the apostolic movement, in the church of Jesus Christ, yeah, I know there's a lot of Christian influencers out there that seem to be able to live for the devil on Instagram and then worship before thousands in a stadium. But as followers of Jesus, we're not chasing influence or clout. We are after the purpose and the calling and the anointing of God. And I want to let you know that is not our model. That is not how we're trying to live. That's not who we're trying to emulate. And if you're ever going to be the kind of disciple that Jesus calls you to be, you got to bury the idols. I feel the Holy Ghost in this room right now. Like Jacob, it's not the first time you've heard a message like this. But I'm reaching for somebody right now that stuff has happened. Life has happened. Family has happened, drama, money, pressure, maybe even some trauma, and I'm reaching for people. You've picked up some coping mechanisms that you know are toxic for your soul, but it's not just a coping mechanism, it's become an idol in your life. And you're wanting God to heal your pain. 
and set you on a path of purpose. But you gotta bury, you gotta bury that toxic relationship first. You gotta bury, you gotta bury those friends first. You've gotta bury that hunger for money first. You've got to bury that desire to chase and climb a ladder so that you can be the first one in your family to make a million bucks or make six figures or have a real career. No, no, no. God God will let you go to university and college and get you right to the point of when you feel like you're about to walk in all the money and all of the possessions and all of the career that no one in your family has ever had and then call you to lay that all on an altar. I'm reaching for this. is not in my notes, but I am reaching for somebody right now that you know God has called you. You know God's got an anointing for you. You know that he's called you to consecrate yourself to him, but at the same time you hear the thundering call of your culture or a relationship or your career, and God's saying right now, what you're looking for, you will only find if you will bury your idols first. Who God is and who He has called you to be has become clouded. The voice of God has been dulled by the foreign gods that occupy your space. It's time to clear it. It's time to clear it. Worldliness has crept in and you've compromised. It's time to visit the terrible tree of surrender again. Not because God is angry. Not because God is vengeful. Not because God is here to judge you because you have fallen short of his glorious call. No, he's here to call you to bury your idols. It's because revelation is on the other side of surrender. Remission is on the other side of repentance. A fresh touch of the Holy Ghost is on the other side of fresh consecration. Bury the idols. This altar is a terebinth tree. Could we stand all over this room? This altar call tonight is a terebinth tree of consecration for you to take everything in your life that has been pulling you away from who God has called you to be and for you to say I'm all in on Jesus. God I've been calling you Lord but I've been calling other things Lord too. God I've been calling you my father and my keeper and my king but I've also been clenching on to other things with my hands. Lord tonight I'm hiding them under the tree. Lord I'm hiding them under the altar. God and I'm not going back. God I'm hungry to see you. I'm I'm hungry to be anointed. I want to walk in purpose. So tonight, I'm burying my idols. I want you to hear the word of the Lord right now. There are people in this room that you have been carrying the weight of trauma in your life that you have been hoping God would lift off of your shoulders. That will happen in the second half of this altar call. God will begin a process of healing that will transform your future. But you're not going to be healed until you learn how to let some stuff go. You got to visit an altar of consecration. Some of you are saying, God, if you would just let me know what I'm called to do, then God, I'll let go of this life I built for myself. No, 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 that's not how it works. God's saying, if you would put the life you've built for yourself under the tree, then I will show you who I am at the place of meeting. God's going to move again in this altar call like he did right before. That's just a taste of the deep work of the Spirit that's going to happen in this room. But you've got to get out of your seat first. You're going to come to this altar and you've got to imagine that in your hands are all of the idols that you've picked up along the way. And if it's not the idol, it's all the stuff that's stained with the scent and the touch of the idols in your life. 
You're bringing your old relationships. You're bringing your contact list. You're bringing your social media addiction. You're bringing your addiction to entertainment. You're bringing your screen time. You're bringing everything. God has gone under the tree. You may be saying, Adam, this is too much. I want to let you know when there is uncommon consecration, God will pour out uncommon anointing. God is calling this generation to more. As they begin to sing right now, I want you to begin to bury it. I want you to bury it. I want you to bury it.